We're doing a little series under the general theme of don't be surprised. And today's session is about a mental battle. And to be honest, we're going to do a little bit of history. We're going to take that first 400 years of the church as kind of the undergirding for this discussions on not being surprised. Uh, the battles that the church faced in those early centuries were significant. They threatened its survival and its existence. And I'm going to take a minute with you because those same battles face us today. And the responses of our brothers and sisters in Christ as the church was beginning are important for us to understand so we'll know how to respond today. Our adversary hasn't changed. His intent hasn't been diminished. He intends to destroy the church of Jesus Christ. And so a little bit of history will prepare us for our assignment in the present. If you hate history, I apologize. Repent. <laughs> you know, the world has changed if you haven't noticed. And some of you that are desperately waiting to go back to where we were before, uh, I don't think that's going to happen. And I don't mean just our congregation and our habits. COVID-19 has proven to be an introduction to tremendous change. Whether that was planned on purpose or it was just seized upon, I don't know. What I do know that is our world has shifted. Things that were hidden or considered in the shadows are now being brazenly expressed in the light for all to look at. The church, in my opinion, was for a, to a great extent ex exposed as being asleep. And God in his mercy is awakening us to our assignment and our purposes as never before. If we get really honest, we, not someone else, we have been self-absorbed. We were sold out to comfort and convenience. But I see some very hopeful things. I see a spirit of repentance and urgency emerging in some of the people with whom I worship that brings me great hope for the people of God. You know, the first 400 years of the church, as I mentioned a moment ago, they faced some very significant struggles, and we see them today. I don't know why we're surprised about that. So I'm taking this series of talks to present to you three specific battles. We looked at one in a previous session, a spiritual battle, and it was principally with other religions. And in this session, we're going to explore a mental battle. And it began to a great extent with the battle with Greek culture. But then we're going to look in the future at a physical battle. And that in our Bibles, it raged from Jerusalem all the way to Rome. But this mental battle is our focus in this session. I want to start in 1 Peter chapter 4. Peter's kind of our coach for this. Peter's the fisherman that Jesus recruited. He began following Jesus as a young man, most likely a teenager. And he had all the brashness and the, the confidence that most of us had as teenagers. But by the time he writes 1st and 2nd, Peter, the two letters that bear his name, he's an older man. In fact, his life is just about done, and he knows it. And he's gathered, a, accumulated a host of life experience and a spiritual resume that suggests we should listen to him carefully. After all, our Lord recruited him. And in the early years of the church in Jerusalem, after Jesus ascended to heaven, it was the force of Peter's character and the strength of his will that was essential in holding that fledgling organization together, not diminishing the role of the Holy Spirit, but he works in the lives of people. To not imagine that we need godly people and godly leaders is to ignore the story of Scripture. Amen. And so we're going to pause and listen to Peter for just a moment as a context for this discussion. First Peter chapter 4, dear friends, do not be surprised at the painful trials, or some translations do it more literally, the fiery ordeal that you're suffering as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice that you participate in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. However, if you suffer as a Christian, don't be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. So then those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. His first instruction to us is to not be surprised at painful trials or fiery ordeals. He said it, but I always am. Aren't you? Something happens that you didn't plan on. You well, I don't know why that happened to me. Well, how about the book told us? You know, when we read the, the, the Gospels, a lot of times I'm tempted to make fun of the disciples, or I think maybe Jesus recruited from the slow group. You know, he says, when we go to Jerusalem, I'm going to be betrayed, arrested. I'll be tried. I'll be condemned to death. I'll be beaten. I'll be crucified. I'll be buried. On the third day, I'll raise again. When all that starts happening, his closest friends, whom he's told multiple times, are completely shocked. And you're reading it going, uh. 
And then I find myself doing the same thing. Don't be surprised at the painful trials. And I'm shocked. Folks, life comes with challenges. And that means you and me. And that's not a negative confession or a faithless response. That's truth. And then Peter talks about suffering. And he, he kind of identifies two buckets. He says if you suffer because your character's broken and you do something wrong, he said that's to be expected. But if you suffer as a Christian, not because of a character, a poor character choice, but if you suffer because of your faith, that's not a new thing. He says it's the nature of the journey. Now, I need you to live with that for a moment because we've lived for the most part in our nation free of suffering because of our faith. I mean, somebody might make fun of you and say you handle snakes because you go to a church that holds a theology they don't hold. Or there may have been some pushback, but, but we haven't really known strident suffering. Is that fair? But I doubt the season that we've entered will come to a conclusion without us understanding a great deal more about suffering. Amen. And Peter says to us, it's an expected part of the journey. And then in verse 19, he introduces something that we need to think about a bit, and I'm not going to unpack it very far today, but he said, those who suffer according to God's will. There's a suffering that comes to our lives that God doesn't attend, it, uh, intend. It's, a, it's an attack from our adversary, and it isn't to be tolerated or embraced or welcomed. We don't submit to that. And then there's a suffering that comes to us as a part of God's will. And what's the difference, Pastor? Well, it, it takes some discernment and some knowledge of Scripture to discern the difference. And it's not always easy to know. It's why we need a meaningful prayer life and the direction of the Holy Spirit. But just to illustrate to you that not all suffering is God-ordained with just a casual review of what you know of Jesus. We know Jesus is a healer. We know Jesus is a miracle worker. We know him as a storm stiller and a death defeater. Not all the trials and vicissitudes that people encountered were there assigned to them by God. Jesus invited them out of those. So we need the wisdom to know the difference. 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8, he's continuing with this thought. He said, be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith. You know that your brothers throughout the world are undergoing the same kind of sufferings. And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you've suffered a little while. My definition of a little while in God's sometimes very greatly. <laughs> will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be power forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Peter says, resist our adversary, standing firm in the faith. Our platform for standing against the suffering begins with our faith, not with our resources or our contact list. We have an adversary. If you're not awakened to the reality yet that there's an adversary to God's purposes in your life, you're in a deficit position. And then Peter says that it's universal in nature. Our adversary, the adversity that comes to our lives is not unique to you. The season when you face it will cause you to think you have been uniquely singled out. It's the nature of how we perceive the world. If it's cold where I am, I just imagine it's cold everywhere. I was in Israel a couple of summers ago with a tour, and when the tour was over, we left Israel to fly to South Africa. There's a difference in the southern hemisphere and the northern hemisphere. The seasons are opposite. We left the heat of the desert in Israel in the summer, and we landed in Af South Africa in the middle of winter. I just put everything on I had. You know, the way we perceive reality is whatever is happening to you should be extrapolated everywhere. And if you're suffering, you think it's unique. It isn't. It's universal. And then Peter says the outcome of suffering when we, when we overcome is that we'll be stronger, more firm, and more steadfast. There's a purpose in it. It's not wasted time or wasted effort or wasted energy. And then finally he closes with something that's more than a benediction. It's more than just a, a closing line. It's just to him be power forever and ever. Peter is reminding us that we need God's power to overcome the adversary. Amen. We don't outthink evil or outwork evil or outtalk evil. We need the power of God. And a church separate from the power of God is an inert church. Amen. 
We can no longer get together and talk about what God does. We have to invite God into the midst of our lives. Now, this mental battle, again, 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 13, he says, prepare your minds for action. Be self-controlled as you set your hope fully on the grace given to you when Jesus Christ is revealed. Prepare your minds for actions. Do you have that imagination that if you're preparing for some sort of action, business, relational, recreational, that it's not just the physical preparation you need, you've got to prepare your mind. And Peter interjects self-control into that. What's the evidence that you've prepared your mind for spiritual action? Self-control. It's one of the fruit of the Spirit. It's not popular today. I'm not overweight because I eat too much. It's McDonald's fault. (laughs) They need to make a healthier quarter pounder with cheese. (laughs) Amen, I heard that. (laughs) Prepare your minds for actions. Folks, we are in the midst of a battle. And it's, it's on our minds. It's our thoughts. And if you're not aware of that, you're almost defeated already. I mentioned history. The Romans, the Roman Empire, they brought law and roads and a common language. They brought order. And the outcome of that was they made travel and communication much easier across a much broader part of the earth than we'd ever known before. The Pax Romana changed our world. It was the perfect time for a message to be broadly communicated across our world. No surprise that Jesus was born in that window of time. Roman cities were built on a pattern. You could visit a Roman city on either side of the empire and you would feel at home, you would recognize familiar landmarks and the layout of the city. You can visit Beit Sha'an in Israel today. It was on the eastern border of the empire, on the border with Persia. And they built a classic Roman city there. They wanted the visitors from Persia to know that even on the outer fringes of the empire, Roman ideas and Roman architecture and Roman way of life was still dominant. You visit that city and the remains of that city in the desert today, and there was a Roman bathhouse, an amphitheater, a hippodrome where they had horse races. All the things you'd find in the city of Rome were out on the very periphery of the empire. Roman order. The Romans bought rules and standardization. But the Romans borrowed much of their culture from the Greeks. Greek thought, a Greek worldview. In that emerging empire, the Greeks were the thinkers. And sooner or later, it was inevitable that Christianity was going to come into conflict with this intellectual thought pattern that emerged from that Greek worldview. The greatest danger that faced the fledgling church in those early years was to what degree would the intellectuals succeed in changing Christianity? You see, our faith cannot be altered to fit the intellect. We change our thoughts to follow God. Now, there's a fundamental acknowledgement in that that every one of us that names Christ as Lord engages in a battle. And the battle begins within us going, I think... And I feel. And apart from the power of God, we will give a transcendent place to that notion of what I think. And a great deal of your discipleship journey and your journey through time preparing for the kingdom of God is to submit what you think to what God thinks. I could spend several sessions with you unpacking. This is alive and well within us. The Bible begins with a statement, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. If you won't accept God as creator of the heavens and the earth, the rest of the book is nonsense. And we all struggle with that because there's an avalanche of information. As you believe something you don't see in the heavens created, uh uh-huh, I do. How did he do it? I don't know. I wasn't there. I don't know how they make a microchip, but I benefit from the rascals. Doesn't offend my intellect in the least, but that battle rages in you. It raged in the early centuries of the church and almost swept it away. It took courage and determination and a fearless response from those early believers in Jesus to give us the privilege of being Christ followers today. And if we don't engage that battle for ourselves and stand together and encourage one another, we will strip the opportunity from the generations following us, from our children and our grandchildren. If you capitulate... 
to the culture that says, why would you believe in God? I can't believe you're so backward. We will forfeit the heritage for our children and our grandchildren. Romans chapter 8 and verse 5 says, those who live according to the sinful nature have their mind set on what the nature, that nature desires. There's a, Paul's going to describe for us a conflict between a, a spiritual worldview and a selfish, carnal, earthly worldview. And the battleground in this whole discussion, discussion is what you think about, what's in your mind. You might circle that word every time you see it. Those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their mind set on what the Spirit desires. How do I know if you're, you're leading a spiritual life? I can listen to you and what you're thinking about will tell me. What you're dreaming about, what you're planning for, what you're making preparations for, it tells me what you've given yourself to. The mind of a sinful man is death, but the mind controlled by the Spirit is life and peace. So your mind's going to be controlled by something. The sinful mind is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those controlled by the sinful nature cannot please God. You can sit in church, but it doesn't mean you please God. Isaiah 55, verse 8, says it in a more positive way. God said, my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. A part of the discipleship journey of submitting your life to Christ is not just reciting the sinner's prayer and getting dunked in a pool. It's allowing the Spirit of God to begin to change how you think. Our distinctiveness from a secular culture should not be the building we gather together in on a Sunday morning or the, our wardrobe choices. It should begin fundamentally with how we think about the world we live in and how we think about one another. It's why a change of heart, the expansion of Christian influence, will change our nation. Our ungodliness and our increasing secularization has caused our thoughts to be increasingly ungodly, and we become increasingly lawless, increasingly wicked, and increasingly violent. Amen. And we will not legislate our way out of that. We have to have a heart change, and it begins in the thoughts of God's people. Amen. We've been absent the arena for too long. Isaiah 65 and verse 2, I've spread out my hands all day long, God said, to a rebellious people who walk in the way which is not good, following their own thoughts. Now, he's talking about the covenant people of God. He's not talking about the pagan nations. He's talking about those who offer sacrifices, who keep the right holidays, who quote the prophets. But he said they're walking according to their own thoughts. So the challenge I'm handing to you is a little personal reflection today and for the next few days about what is forming your thoughts. What are you longing for? What are you dreaming about? What are you sacrificing for? See, this was a much more difficult battle for this fledgling church because it was a battle inside the church. This is not an external battle. It was a conflict conducted with words and ink. It requires mental effort and self-discipline and thought. And I cannot say that the 21st century church in the West has been defined by thought and self-discipline. Some of the best writings we have of the early church come from this struggle. A man called Irenaeus, he wrote five books under the title Against Heresies, trying to respond to the message that was spreading through the church Thank God he did. Origen wrote prolifically books, letters, pamphlets, hundreds and hundreds of them. Marcion, you may have heard of him, or you might not. He was a thinker from this time within the Christian community. It's an important point to get, within the Christian community. Marcion said, I don't like a God of wrath. And I can't understand the God of the Old Testament. In fact, he was quite certain that the God of the Old Testament was different from the God of the New Testament, even Jesus. So he eliminated the Old Testament from the Bible. He said, we're just not going to be New, Te we're going to be New Testament people. Folks, this is not an old idea. Well, I mean, it happened in antiquity, but we hear it today. We've heard it here. He was also uncomfortable with the book of Revelation. Too Old Testament-like, he said. In fact, the more he thought about it, he felt like Paul had said some unkind things, and those should be edited out as well. 
It was an early battle within the church, within the church, two gods, the God of the Old Testament, the God of the New Testament. It's a heresy we fight until today. Well, I just don't like to read the Old Testament. I'm sorry, that wasn't presented to you as an option. <laughs> Revelation makes me feel uncomfortable. Perhaps you should get better prepared. Amen. Not all parts of the story are easily read. I understand that. Some are frightening. Some make me uncomfortable. But the Christians in those early centuries said, we're going to stay with the whole word. Even if it's difficult to understand and even if we have to wrestle with some of the ideas that are in it, we're not going to edit or censor the Bible to align more easily with what we think or understand. Amen. The battle was won in those early centuries and we still have our Bible. If they hadn't won, we wouldn't have the text today. Amen. I'm not talking about King James versus NIV or New American Standard or whatever your preference is. I'm talking about the body of the text what are we doing? Do we treat it as if it's important or valuable? Do we want the Bible to be conformed to the prevailing ideas of the day? Do we want to make it gender neutral? Do we want to blur the lines? It's very common. There was another challenge they faced. It's called Gnosticism. From the Greek word gnosis, it means to know. And it was a tremendous struggle, a greater struggle than the one that Marcion introduced. Agnostics, still a word we use today, agnostics say they don't know if there is a God. Well, the Gnostics said the opposite. They said, we know. In fact, they said, we have a secret knowledge that most of you don't have. Again, a battle within the confines of the Christian community, not a secular battle. The Greek intellectualism, the secular culture, widely embraced Gnosticism. In fact, they criticized Christianity. It was a mixture of thought that went into this. Some came from Egypt, some from Persia, maybe even some from India. But basically the idea was that spiritual things are good and physical things are bad. You want to attach more significance to spiritual than you do physical. And it led to some very disruptive ideas within the Christian church. The Christian church was influenced by the prevailing thought of the broader culture. So if physical things are bad, then matter. Matter is a kind of a technical word. Matter is anything that occupies space and has weight. It's physical. If matter is bad, then God couldn't have created it. And if matter is evil, Jesus would never have taken a body of flesh. So the teaching proliferating in the church was that Jesus only appeared to have been in a body. That he never got hungry, he never got tired, he wasn't subjected to the things that you and I are subjected to. Expanded idea means that Jesus couldn't have died on a cross or been resurrected from the dead. It required the greatest minds and the greatest hearts of the church to put themselves on the front line to turn back that idea. Now some of this you know, maybe you just weren't aware of it. The Apostle John addressed it in his gospel in the first epistle. John 1 and verse 14, John said, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory and the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. In his first epistle, 1 John 1 and verse 1, John, he, he wrote, This which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at, which our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. John was pushing back against, refuting this idea that had infected the church. This notion that the church shouldn't talk about current thought and current events ignores the principles of Scripture. Amen. We desperately need a God perspective on what's happening in our world. Amen. And this challenge is alive and well in planet Earth today. It took about 150 years for the church to win this battle. It was not a weekend seminar. 150 years, would you give yourself to standing for the truth, for the faith of God, for advocating for Jesus, and not see the victory in your lifetime? And imagine that you weren't defeated? We have been so short-sighted. Again, I, I started by saying we've become absorbed in selfishness, comfort and convenience. That's all about the moment, what's in it for me right now. 
Well, I don't like where I had to park, or I don't like the seat I had to sit in, or I didn't like the musical part. Really, we have, have we really devolved to that point in our worship of the King of kings and the Lord of lords? Amen. We can't stay there and be the church we need to be in the world. Amen. There were other people who contributed, obviously. Tertullian from Carthage in North Africa, he wrote against Gnosticism. Clement and Origen, they lived in Alexandria. You know, another battle that emerged wasn't about... What about our faith? What about Jesus? But it was what was said about Christians. And there was a horrific set of things said about Christians in antiquity. They were broadly accused of being cannibalistic. They took the notion of the Lord's Supper and they turned it back on us. They no doubt heard Jesus said, unless you eat my body and drink my blood. And so the rumor started that it had tremendous traction and influence. It made it a sacrifice to publicly identify with Christians. Christians were accused of having sexual orgies that were beyond the pale. And to be beyond the pale in the Roman world, that was something. You can make a list of things that are said about Christians today. Some of them grounded partially in truth. Some of them partially grounded in the failures of Christians who have been public that cause you to want to be quiet about your faith? Folks, it's not new. We're not unique. The question is, how will we respond? What will we do? We have lived in the shelter of this personal salvation that means I'm absolved of any responsibility to community or culture or the broader world. It's a heresy. I believe in personal salvation or conversion or being born again, whichever label you prefer, but that's your entry into the kingdom. You pick up your assignment at that point. It's not a way of avoiding the broader world. There were responses to these confusing messages that came from the church. One was the canon of Scripture. They decided what books were in. One of their great responses to this myriad of confusing messages regarding our faith was to put, put together all the books that went back to the apostles that had known Jesus and begin to think of it as Scripture. By 200 A.D., they'd identified the books that went back to the apostles. By the late 4th century, the 27 books we know as the New Testament were put together and defended in that context. Understand, there were many false gospels. There were many books written attributed to Paul or attributed to other disciples or apostles or followers of Jesus. By the late 4th century, we had a canon. Another thing they did to respond was creeds. The, the, word, the creed comes from the, the Greek word credo. It means I believe. They put together concise statements of the fundamental beliefs of Christianity, and they learned them. Cell phone coverage was really spotty in the ancient world. And there were places where you couldn't get a text and you couldn't get the internet. So they put together these concise summations of the principal tenets of Christianity and would teach them to one another and to their children so that they would understand. They would have the fundamentals in their heart. The Apostles' Creed, perhaps, is the best known today. In our New Testament, we find several summaries of essential truth. I put one in your notes, Ephesians 4 and verse 3. Paul's writing to the church in Ephesus, a secular Greek Roman city. He said, make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There's one body, one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of us all, who is over all and through all and in all. Well, the Romans had a pantheon. Dozens and dozens and dozens of gods. You could pick a god today and another one tomorrow and a collection for the next day. And Paul is trying to ground the believers in Ephesus. We need grounded in the word of God. There's some things we say that are very destructive. Well, I don't like to read my Bible. I got it. It's not an easy book to read. It's actually 66 books. It's written over a broad period of history from different cultures. It's not arraigned chronologically. There's many things confusing about it. When you see the Lord, take it up. <laughs> but rather than say you don't like to read it, you need to inject a different thought. I think maybe I'd like to walk away from the kingdom of God. Because without a, a routine commitment to Scripture in your life, I hold very little hope that you can maintain your momentum in the kingdom of God. I don't want you to live fearful or frightened 
But I do want you to be prepared. So they put together a canon of scripture. They had creedal statements. They had councils, gatherings of leaders of the church to help turn back some of these aberrant ideas that were devastating the body of Christ. It began with the apostles. Again, it began in our Bible. They weren't creating something out of new cloth. These struggles started in the very early days of the church. The early days, not the early decades. In Acts chapter 15, there's a dispute in Antioch about the degree to which the Gentile, the non-Jewish believers in Jesus, should cooperate with the laws of Moses because the Jewish believers have been keeping the laws of Moses for hundreds of years. And the idea was, look, if we've had to suffer these things, you should have to suffer these things too. And you can imagine it led to a collision as the gospel got further and further away from the land of Israel and the Jewish people. And Paul and Barnabas are in Antioch, and this this emerges into a full-blown argument. So they decide to go to Jerusalem and ask the apostles. They're still there. It's Acts 15, 6. You've got it in your notes. The apostles and elders met to consider this question. And after much discussion, Peter got up. Now, you, you can read past this, but when Peter stands, he's the voice of authority. It's been broadly discussed. Everybody's had an opinion. We've heard the people from Antioch. We've heard from the Jewish community. We've heard from the non-Jewish community. There's no consensus. We, we can't sort this out. And Peter stands up. Peter that walked on the water, Peter that was on the Mount of Transfiguration, Peter that denied the Lord, Peter that was reinstated by the Lord, Peter that preached on the day of Pentecost. Peter stands up. And he addressed them, brothers, you know that some time ago God made a choice among you that the Gentiles might hear from my lips the message of the gospel and believe. He went from Jaffa to Caesarea to Cornelius' house. And Peter very carefully says, God made that choice. God sent me there. I didn't want to go there. God, who knows the heart, showed that he accepted them, the non-Jews, by giving the Holy Spirit to them, just as he did to us. He made no distinction between us and them, for he purified their hearts by faith. When Peter says God made no distinction between Jew and Gentile, he is standing against an idea that defined his people for hundreds of years. They were the chosen people of God and they knew it to the core of their being. And Peter, he's not sophisticated. He's not educated in the way Paul is. The words he writes with are simple words. He's had a change from the inside out. Folks, I'm concerned for us. We've had this flimsy, whimsical kind of Christianity where we tell a story about some point in the past where we weren't so good and we came to Jesus and we made some marginal improvements. That's not what happened to the people that we know. How they saw their world change, how they interacted with their world changed. He made no distinction between us and them. He purified their hearts by faith. Now then, why do you try to test God by putting on the necks of the disciples a yoke that neither we nor our fathers have been able to bear? No. It's emphatic. He's already said it, but he gets to this point. You can see him looking across the room. No. We can't do this, he says. We believe it's through the grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved, just as they are. And the whole assembly became silent. No kidding. And now they listened to Barnabas and Paul telling about the miraculous signs and wonders that God was doing among the non-Jews through them. When they finished, James spoke up. This is the brother of Jesus. And now the leader, the identified leader of the church in Jerusalem. So Peter, the apostle that has known him the best, or certainly known Jesus well, has issued his authoritative opinion. Now James stands as the leader of the church in Jerusalem. Brothers, listen to me. Simon has described to us how God had first showed his concern by taking from the Gentiles a people for himself. He did call us to be a chosen people, he said. The words of the prophets are in agreement with this. Now it's my judgment that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. 
we should write to them, telling them to abstain from food polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, and from the meat strangled, of strangled animals and from blood. Folks, there was a battle about to tear apart the fabric of the church. And we're not out of the book of Acts yet. And it didn't stop there. The first ecumenical council of the leaders of the church beyond our New Testament took place in 325 AD, the Council of Nicaea. It's in Turkey, modern day Turkey. It was called by the Roman emperor, by that time the Roman emperor, the first Roman emperor to, to acknowledge Christianity for himself, Constantine. The church leaders who arrived at that first ecumenical council arrived bearing in their bodies the marks of their faith. There was a number of emperors who persecuted Christians by either cutting their Achilles tendon or putting out an eye. So that first gathering of church leaders showed up lame and blind. The issue dividing the church that caused them to gather was Arianism. You think it's a big word, I don't care about it. You should. At the heart of Arianism was the idea that Jesus is not divine. He was created. Maybe a good man, maybe a miracle worker, maybe a teacher. We should pay some attention to him, but he's not the divine son of God. Sound familiar? The diminishment of Jesus. And they recognized for, it, for what it was, if it was left to proliferate within the church, we'd be destroyed. Amen. Have you heard of the Nicene Creed? It's one of the oldest creedal statements in the Christian church. It dates back to that period in the fourth century. I brought you just the first lines. I think with that bit of background, you'll understand what they were trying to establish. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, and all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from light, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made for us, for us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. They didn't want there to be any equivocation. And what have we done? We have a church face and a work face and a recreation face. Folks, God is shaking us. You see, the challenge with this battle, with this mental battle, is it comes in the name of Christ. That's the fundamental challenge. If a person comes in the name of the devil, we've got perspective. But when someone comes in the name of Jesus, this is a new theology, a new morality, a new gospel, a new Christianity. We have to be aware enough to say there is no new Christianity. There's only the old one. And we, you and me, we're to contend for the faith once delivered to us by those who preceded us. They fought this battle in the first 400 years and they won. It's why we have a church in the earth today. Amen. What will we give to our children and grandchildren? Our struggle today, one principal component of it is relativism. Now be candid with you, I think we've lost to a great degree our sense of the fundamentals of the church, who we're to be, what's necessary to believe, what our role in our world is to be. It's understandable, it's easy to be bewildered by the array of answers available in the marketplace of ideas today. You can just throw up your hands and say, you know, they're all valid options. I don't want to deal with it. We're lazy. What did Peter say? Prepare your minds for action. Be self-controlled. Do the work to understand. Think. Don't spend your time just thinking about your hobbies or just thinking about how to multiply your, your wealth. Don't just think about what you want for your children. Think about the eternal kingdom of God. Apply yourself. See, pluralism leads to relativism. If all ideas are equal, then everything just becomes relative. Do what you want to do. The idea that there's no overarching objective truth, but only a variety of subjective beliefs. No real truth, just your truth and my truth. Here a truth, there a truth, everywhere a truth, truth. <laughs> it's important to take a moment with because the scripture is clear. If we fail to fulfill the purpose for which God instituted the church, we fail in our primary responsibility as Christ followers. Amen. Our primary goal is not to go to heaven. 
Our primary goal is to do the will of God while on earth. Amen. Heaven is an outcome of that desire. And if you don't desire that, the, the, the notion of participating in the eternal purposes of God is unlikely. In Matthew 5, Jesus said, you're the salt of the earth. You know the verse. In John 15, he said, every branch that doesn't bear fruit is cut off. Plain language. Now, lest we be filled with despair and hopelessness, there is significant historical evidence that cultures can be renewed, even those that have been considered the most corrupt and intractable. But if we're to see restoration come to our world, we'll first have to shake off the comfortable notion that Christianity is just a personal experience, applying only to one's private life. It has no business in the public square. It's just a lie. The poet John Donne wrote that no man is an island, yet one of the great myths of our day is that we are islands, that our decisions are personal, that no one has a right to tell us what to do in our private lives. We very conveniently forget that every private decision contributes to the moral and cultural climate in which we live, rippling out in these concentric circles with greater and greater impact, our personal lives, our family lives, and then in the broader society. In a very alarming degree, moral clarity is hard to find in our schools, our universities, our halls of governments, and tragically, even in pulpits. Places where one time, in the not too distant past, things like patriotism, honor, courage, and truth were understood to be disseminated. They're needed the most there today and too frequently are absent. Instead of civics, our students are steeped in moral ambivalence and cynicism. They're routinely taught as a matter of habit that America represents nothing more than one of the many different equal nations. That there's no such thing as a better or a worse culture, only morally equivalent ones. Not new ideas, folks. That cultural values differ from our own regardless of their substance, need to be celebrated in the spirit of tolerance, and that all things considered, Americans have at least as much to answer for as to be proud of. It's moral relativism at its worst. It undermines the love of country. It provides intellectual insulation to our enemies and adversaries, and it represents a grave threat to our long-term security as a people. And to be honest, it has to stop. The moral clarity does not require an uncritical evaluation of our history or our Western ideals. Patriotism should not be confused with crude nationalism. Injustices, shortcomings, and sins are surely a part of our story, and we should say so. But a fair and a serious study of our history also shows that without a doubt, our nation and the church in our nation has been and continues to be a great force for good in the modern world. Amen. We're heirs to a legacy, and the perpetuation of our nation and the health of the church is not assured. Pericles said to his fellow Athenians, your country has a right to your services in sustaining the glories of her position. These are a common source of pride to you all, and you cannot decline the burdens of empire and still expect to share its honors. The freedoms and liberties that have come to us have come to us at a tremendous sacrifice in the church and in our nation. And they will not be extended if we are not willing to make a sacrifice on behalf of them. A nation or a church that declines its burden is a nation indifferent as to why it fights. There's a mental battle underway. We'll deteriorate, decline, and ultimately fail. It's the prospect we, fa we face. And I believe the time has come for us to begin remembering that the church has an important role to play in the lives of our communities and our nation. We have been assigned a message, a message that must be reestablished with each generation. Human beings need a savior. Almighty God, the creator of heaven and earth, has intervened and sent his son. And anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. It's the essence of the message we hold out into the world without apology, without timidity. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 14 says, Do everything without complaining or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God, without fault in a crooked and a depraved generation. The early church understood they lived in a crooked and depraved generation. They're not whining about it. Neither should we. 
in which you shine like stars in the universe and you hold out the word of life. That's our assignment, to be light in the darkness and to hold out the word of life. It's not that I work in a difficult place. I've been sent there to be a light. It's not that our schools are more pagan than we would like. We've been sent here to hold out the light. It's not that our universities have rejected God. We've got to go turn on the light. 2 Timothy 3 says, Mark this, there'll be terrible times in the last days. We've been forewarned. What did Peter say? Don't be surprised. Why are we surprised? Because <laughs> we're not listening. And then he gives more than a dozen characteristics of human attitude that will deteriorate. He says people will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Sounds about right. He said they'll have a form of godliness but deny its power. Here's the battle. It's not beyond the church, folks. This is us. It's not something apart from us. Just as Janes and Jambres opposed Moses, these men opposed the truth. Men of depraved minds. Messages within the body opposing the truth of God. In Jude, the first chapter, start in verse 22, says, Keep yourself in God's love as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you eternal life. That's the waiting. I've been born again. I've experienced a conversion. But while you're waiting, he says, be merciful to those who doubt. Snatch others from the fire and save them. To others, show mercy. You see, the battle in our minds is not just a conflict to overcome negative thoughts or to relieve ourselves of limiting ideas or just to offload destructive emotions. That's where I believe we've accepted a deception in this notion of the battle in our minds. We've wanted to use the power of God to help us be happier people. But I'm not opposed to happiness. And it's important that we know how to offload negative thoughts and to offload destructive emotions. That's an important part of growing up in the Lord. But it's also true that we have to have the discipline to let the truth of God fill our hearts and minds and form a worldview that helps us extend the light into the world in which we are and not capitulate. We cannot be overcome with Christian selfishness. The renewing of our mind must be extended to the discipline of thought and learning and training. You get this fundamentally. If I'm scheduled for a medical exam or surgery, I would prefer medical care from a physician who wasn't too lazy to learn You know, I always wanted to be a doctor. I like drugs. <laughs> but I never really enjoyed, you know, all the labs. And so I just skipped all of that. What were we going to cut out of you today, Mr. Jackson? <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> you know, I prefer, I prefer to avoid traveling on a jet with a pilot who avoided math and physics. I just like to go fast. <laughs> not with me, thank you. Well, in a similar way, we'll not become an effective church until we engage our minds and submit them to God. Amen. Think about the sacrifices you've made to cultivate expertise in your profession or expertise in how you parent or to garner expertise on your hobby of preference. Think about the dollars invested, the time invested, the thought invested, how hungry you were for information and knowledge, the statistics you've memorized. And then think about your faith. If our faith is secondary to any of those categories, we have some work to do. Amen. Christians who endorse values contrary to Scripture are not a new thing. They're as old as the Christian church. We face the 21st century of this ongoing conflict. You see it all around you, within the church. Attitudes regarding sexual immorality, the sanctity of human life, the definition of marriage, attempts to blur gender, the authority of scripture, the divinity of Jesus. You don't have to go outside the church to find an assault on those things. I hear Christian leaders say, well, we don't lead with that topic. Well, what do you lead with? And again, I, we're all a part of this. 
It's not something new to the 21st century. That's our mistake. That's our lack of awareness of the battle. There has been a tremendous effort made for you and I to have the privilege to call on the name of Jesus. And the question is, what will we extend to our children and grandchildren? And the battle within our hearts shouldn't surprise us. In Galatians chapter 5, I'm about done, there's hope. In Galatians 5, Paul says, You, my brothers, were called to be free. Do not use your freedom to indulge the sinful nature. Folks, it's the, we could, those words fit perfectly for us today. Don't use the freedom that we've come to know through the shed blood of Jesus Christ just so we can lead indulgent lives. Don't take the scripture and twist it just so you get God's power to indulge your carnal, selfish self. So I say, live by the Spirit and you'll not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. Give the Spirit of God a greater place in your life. The acts of the sinful nature, he says, are obvious. And he starts to list them. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord. And then he gives you the punchline. I warn you as I did before. He said, I've told you this before and I'm going to tell you this again. Those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. You can't do that. We started with Peter. We'll end there. Second Peter chapter 2. He said there were false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. Again, not a new thing. If it was a problem in Peter's day, Peter, by the time he writes this letter at the end of his life, understands it's a part of the journey. It's like weeds in the garden. They should be expected. If you're surprised by weeds growing amongst your tomato plants, you are very new to tomato plants. <laughs> There'll be false teachers among you. They'll secretly introduce destructive heresies. They won't do it openly. They will do it deceptively. That's why it's secretive. They'll even deny the sovereign Lord who bought them. Many will follow their shameful ways and will bring the way of truth into disrepute. Many. In their greed, these teachers will exploit you with stories they have made up. Their condemnation has long been hanging over them. And their destruction has not been sleeping. Peter calls them brute beasts. Unthinking. Self-willed. Unaware. Folks, the church matters. And I don't mean a congregation or a building. I mean the people of God. We've been entrusted with a message that makes an eternal difference in the lives of the inhabitants of planet Earth. We shouldn't be surprised, Peter said, that we have an adversary that seeks to disrupt our momentum. We have an adversary without and we have a battle within because we have an earthly carnal nature. And the battlefield for much of that is our mind. And we've been very unaware of this. We've accepted a lot of sloppy Christianity. We wanted to know what we needed to do get a, to get an entrance ticket, and we've been very little concerned beyond that. But God is helping us. Amen. He's awakening us. He's giving us new courage and new boldness. I'm more hopeful for the church than at any point in my journey up till this point. Amen. The threats beyond us are not a tremendous concern because if we will yield our hearts to the Lord, He will bring victory to us. You don't have to be frightened in this world. God will take his people through. But it's not casual or accidental or infrequent. How often do I need to be with God's people? As frequently as you can be. I brought you a prayer. We're going to work on the next section of this sometime, whenever we get together next. Why don't you stand with me? Let's read this prayer together. You know, the prayer at church, I don't, in my imagination, it's not just a prayer we pray while we're here. It's kind of a prayer for the week. You know, they roll them into those battle plans that we've been sharing with you, some prayers to pray every day. Because I, in, in my life, I find that my best ideas, my best insights usually come after a meeting. You ever find that? You know, I'm brilliant after the fact. <laughs> and a lot of times I feel that way about church. You know, when we're together, we're kind of caught up in the moment, but 
after the fact, there's more space for me to listen to what God would say or do in my life. So taking these prayers and using them on a daily basis or whatever your devotional pattern is, is an invitation to the Spirit of God to bring change to you and awareness to you and to help you. You'll, you'll find your own voice to pray, but borrowing prayers is a great way to open the door to, is an invitation to the Spirit of God. Let's pray this one together. Heavenly Father, our hope is in you and in you alone. We boldly declare Jesus is Lord in our world. Through him all things were made. He is the faithful witness and the ruler of the kings of the earth. We submit ourselves to his authority and leadership. Through faith in Jesus, our sins are forgiven, our strength is renewed, and our hope is secure. Holy Spirit, grant us a revelation of Jesus that will bring victory to our lives. In his name, amen.